So this is the fourth day of this four day retreat. The mind trainings of Lojong, as it's called in Tibetan, and kind of come down to us uh, from the Indian uh, master Atisha. He received them from his teachers, so they received them from their teachers. And he has come down to us in Tampa this week. Causes and conditions and impermanence. With all of us in this room, it's simply causes and conditions uh, that brought us to the Dharma path. It's just causes and conditions that brought us to the Florida community of mindfulness. It's causes and conditions that brought us to come to this retreat. And these causes and conditions that will lead us to return to our non retreat lives in just a few hours. Everything is impermanent. Coming down here just a few minutes ago, I walked through the halls. The halls are covered with dirty sheets outside every room. Impermanent. Beds that were slept in last night are empty, ready to receive uh, new guests. This is not unusual. This is what's going on every day. Things are just unfolding this world of impermanence according to causes and conditions. And hopefully uh, the ease of coming and the ease of staying and the ease of going is all easy. This is just the way it is. It is a fact of life. And we want to uh, learn how to uh, be in life Ease, openness, with uh, intelligence, compassion, understanding, kindness, and heartedness, generosity, etc. So, hopefully, the same way that we move through the ease of the comings and goings of this retreat, we move through the comings and goings of our life. They are no different. Over these past four days, uh, there has been uh, much uh, teachings, much practice. And everybody in here has gone through mind states, haven't you? We taught this and we taught that. And this mind state arose and that mind state arose. Sometimes your mind was clear, and sometimes your mind was unclear. Sometimes your mind was restful. Sometimes it was agitated. Sometimes you were happy, sometimes you were sad. Sometimes you thought, oh, I'm doing well, and sometimes you thought, oh, you're doing terrible. Sometimes you were happy to be here, and sometimes you couldn't wait till it was over. Right? Etc., 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 and all of that. Where is that all now? Gone. Not a, not a trace. Gone. Just think if you had known it then, would you have gotten hooked up into what you got hooked up into? Stuck in what you got stuck in, fixated on what you were fixated, made such a big deal about what you made such a big deal about. If you understood that one day you'd be sitting here and it would be all gone. Right? Doesn't matter in the slightest. You had a good retreat, you had a terrible retreat. Doesn't matter. Right? You thought 
thought this, you thought that, you, you liked this, you didn't like that. You thought this was delicious, you thought this was terrible. Where is that? God. Wisdom is understanding this not afterwards, but at the time. There are no points for being wise today about yesterday. Is that clear? Cultivating wisdom is, is you finally get it, and now you live it. So when it is arising, you understand that whatever is arising, good or bad, is just arising and it will be passing. It isn't substanceless. We had some experiences uh, spending time looking into this mind of ours and watching it. Looking into thoughts. Nothing of any solid, permanent self-existence is found at all. And even these karmic imprints that, you know, that we're so concerned about, when we look for them, we can't even find them. With true insight, it makes a deep imprint on the mind it changes us. That's what we want. We said in the tradition, uh, you know, mindfulness, certainly wonderful, will not liberate us. You can be just you know, very mindful of your delusions. So a few points for that. You can be mindful of your uh, ego. A few points for that, uh, but that's not liberation. Liberation only comes from insight. The practice of compassion and loving kindness, in the way that you know, we have shown here in this text, is one way to open that door to liberation. An essential way. Uh, so over these uh, past uh, four days, I just counted them up. Uh, we focused on eleven short sentences. That's what we did. Eleven slogans. Most of them very short sentences. Why they're called pith tichi. They could be small, but they, they have a kernel of great insight and wisdom. Again, this is a wondrous text because uh, so much, if not all, of the essential teachings and practices uh, of the Bodhisattva Mahayana path are in this text. going to have a few companion texts with you on your journey in this life, this would be one of them. If you're going to use your mind for any uh, benefit, uh, memorize these slogans. So you can take them out as needed. Uh, so let us, uh, I want to, uh, you know, we don't have much time this morning, it's, it's an abbreviated morning. Uh, but I want to make sure that there is uh, you know, not perfect understanding and realization on all the points, but there's a basic uh, understanding of what we've been up to. Again, as you've heard me say uh, over and over again, uh, there's training the preliminaries, and they are essential. They come before come before practice. 
they get us ready to practice. They prepare us to practice. Is that clear? And to be able to repeat them like a parrot is not to know them and to really see their profound and deep implications for our life. The way we conduct our lives, not just overall, but every day. Which again, I assure you that if you contemplate deeply and really are willing to look at the implications of what these preliminaries are telling us. Not to say all, I won't say all. I'll say most of the dramas and the fixations and the obsessions and the ruminations and the melodramas and the emotionality uh, that afflict you will no longer. This is even before you've learned anything about meditation. Your life will be significantly different just by the deep contemplation, reflection on these uh, four reflections. There is a reason they have been preserved. There is a reason they are still taught. So again, first train in the preliminaries. Train. Training implies over and over, training in them. Training what? Training to view reality as it really is. In our ignorance, we what? We see permanent solidness where there is impermanence and no solidity. Fundamentalness perception. All day long we do it. Whether it's all the external things that appear to uh, our uh, five senses or the internal phenomena, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories that appear to our mind. All day long we perceive them as solid, permanent things. Fundamental misperception. Once we make that misperception, the drama of samsara will unfold. All day long, we do not see cause and effect. We see effect, we don't see cause. And because we do not see a cause, and we only see effect, and we interpret it through our misperceptions, again, off we go. The whole world of misperception, emotional affliction that we create every day is because we don't understand causation. And understand effects and we you know how did it happen right? that's ignorance if you don't know causation then we're ignorant then. and yet that doesn't stop us because we still carry on blind to cause and effect we, we just you know undertake relationships open our mouths spout out this and that. The blind leading the blind. Isn't that the truth? Please. Cause and effect. Understand what's unfolding and why. The fundamental defects of samsara. What is occupying our minds day and night? the activities of the world. Right? Right? Why do we have our mood changes? So all you're thinking about is this world and how I can find safety, happiness, meaning in this world. Get more things, get more money, get more relationships, get a you know, geographical cure. I mean, we are endlessly manipulating the world of phenomena and things because we believe 
no matter how much dharma we've been exposed to, right, that happiness will be found. We just get it right. And then along comes this teaching that says, you'll never get it right. There's a fundamental flaw, there's a fundamental defect. Right? Why are you working so hard to get it right? It doesn't work out the way you want. That's the truth. And everybody in here knows that, right? Because it hasn't worked out the way you wanted your whole life. But that doesn't stop us. Right? You will leave here and you'll continue on. Even though the teachings are very clear. Doesn't mean, again, you know, this is not like, you know, doesn't mean we can't find temporary moments of happiness and joy and pleasure. But that's only one side of this. Not clear. The other side is also here, and it's because of that. For those who really are looking for meaning and purpose and happiness and joy and peace of mind, etc., they know they will never find it as long as I'm looking to a field that is essentially hollow. It doesn't mean things don't grow there. They don't grow there. You know, I, again, I, I realize this uh, may sound heavy duty, uh, but again, I'm not, uh, this is not Fred speaking. I'm just a representative, a lowly representative of the noble Lord Buddha. He's the one who set down this edict. Not just a guy carrying the message. It's unclear. It is the message of every master from beginningless time. Now, why did they say it? They're not in it for the money. You know, why did they say it to us? We have to stop and think, why did they say that? It is only because of their compassion. Because they see us suffering, they see us running around wearing ourselves out, getting weary, getting brokenhearted, you know, getting stressed out, right? Getting disappointed, getting hurt, getting angry, getting frustrated, getting depressed, getting anxious, right? They see us running around and around in life. They see what's going on, getting addicted. Right? I mean, you know, we don't even bat our eyes when we hear somebody's got into rehab. So no, it's part of life. This one's on that antidepressant, this one's on that anti-anxiety, right? So you don't go, gee, maybe there's some fundamental defect in <laughs> people, you know what I mean? That people need all this stuff to keep going, right? If you want to make some money, invest in uh, the pharmaceutical industry. They understand what's going on. They figured out a way to make money on it. Right? Uh, but again, uh, Buddhism and Masters saw this thousands of years ago. And so they set forth these fundamental contemplations that we can see clearly to save us more uh, dissatisfaction, more frustration, more, you know, no matter what we're doing, even things are going well, deep down inside, you, there's something never quite right. Some would just give you something a little nagging in the background. You can never totally satisfied. There's always something missing, even when things are good. 
Here's the tree plant. And then, of course, the uh, forest about the uh, preciousness is to really understand uh, the unique uh, advantages of, of having a human birth as opposed to other uh, forms of life. And then again, uh, for those of us, et cetera, with the junctions and the freedoms, I won't go into that again. And as I will, uh, illustrated in, in, during the retreat, and you can continue to meditate on them. Uh, you know, how you know, we are so fortunate. We're not, you know, we're not, you know, walking through Europe, getting away from war and ravage in the Middle East. Homeless and shelterless. People being so indifferent to us. Huh? We're so fortunate. Those of us sitting here. We are fortunate, I mean, that's just an extreme example, but I mean, we're just so fortunate because, you know, we have these teachings that tell us, explain what's going on and, and how to be happy. And how to have a meaningful life. Right? It's not as if we have to do anything uh, grand, it's not as if we have to uh, you know, significantly make external changes. We just need to change our minds. We just need to change our minds. We can change the way we speak and the way we uh, behave and the things we do with our body. And all of a sudden, uh, you know, our life is no longer a source of suffering to ourselves and to other people, but our life is a source of goodness. To ourselves and other people. We can be a refuge. We can be of help. We can be of true nurturance and support. We have to turn away from our you know, elusive, endless running after that which is essentially meaningless. And we have to give up the self that is, you know, constantly egging us on. Right? And we even come to a retreat, right? How wonderful. Good weather, good friends, good food, decent beds, you know, right? Dharma, you know. And this, and this self will complain in here, won't it? How many people heard their complaining voice? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, there it is. Me, 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 me. me. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? I'm not getting my way. At some point, we got to kind of get it. <laughs> you know. And so, please. Uh, First, begin with the preliminaries. And then uh, the second day, we spend a full day uh, teachings and the practices relating to uh, ultimate bodhicitta. And again, uh, absolute bodhicitta. And again, uh, as you probably uh, have already put together, uh, the teachings that uh, we received here uh, coming from Atisha, uh, you know, coming from this tradition, is the same teaching about the nature of mind and nature of phenomena that you've chanted every morning in the Heart Sutra. It is the original teachings of the Buddha about the nature of phenomena and the nature of mind. So there it is, you know, the classical Buddhist teaching in the Heart Sutra, Parsamparamita Vidaya Sutra. Uh, you know, then you, you know, you flip a few pages, third Zen patriarch, right? Trust in mind. China, Zen, not India, not Tibet. Same teaching. Same teaching. Uh, so again, uh, as it is said in the text, uh, these are the most profound insights of Buddhism. But again, uh, you, you know, last night we did some practice. I mean, the, day, the night before we did some practice. Right? And hopefully uh, many people at least got a little taste little glimpse of this uh, absolute bodhicitta. This mind is more than a collection of thoughts. This is this unborn awareness. 
you can notice that can be penetrated and that can be rested in. And that one can make it the basis uh, of one's life. And we are told after our meditations on Atul Bodhicitta to now go into the world as a conjurer. Know that everything he perceives, everything he sees, smells, tastes, touch, feels, thinks, is just his own conjuring, her own conjuring. In the house of illusions, only the illusionist knows the truth. Everybody else is fooled, right? But the conjurer, the illusionist, knows what's up. In the teachings of Absolute Bodhicitta, you are given the key. I'm the illusionist. All thoughts, feelings, perceptions, all my conceptualizations, all the fabrications of my mind are the creations of my own mind. Right? They're not coming from anywhere else. They're my own creations. Now the illusionist, the, the, the conjurer, is intelligent enough to know that. But that which is his conjuring is just to show. It's to entertain. But it's not real. The conjurer knows it's not real. The illusionist knows it's not real. But we are like some kind of mythical uh, creature uh, that has kind of, you know, we, we, we're like an amnesia. And we look at around at a room full of our own creations and we think they're real. Is that the truth? So, these teachings and most importantly the practices uh, of Absolute Bodhicitta return us to sanity. Sanity. Right? Is that clear? In, in the world of mental health, right? we said there are some people who are sane. Some people who are insane. Of course, a lot depends on you know, which one you are to, to call the others. But uh, we won't go into that one. But generally, there is a sense that people who are sane are seeing reality without distortion, right? I mean, that's the hubris of the sane. Uh, right? And somebody who is insane is what? Somebody who is insane is what? Not seeing reality. They're crazy. They don't see reality. They think the fabrications of their mind are real. We say, that person's crazy. They hear voices in their head and they think they're real. Anybody hear a voice in their head during this retreat? <laughs> Did you think that voice was real? Yes. I mean, right? some people might call that insane or crazy. We endlessly project, you know, out into the world on everyone we see, every situation, right? Judgments, evaluations, comparisons, I mean, interpretations, all that's called projections. Right? And we think they're real. Right? Again, if a human being sees things that aren't there, but thinks they're real, what do they call Brandy? or crazy in, in, in the old way. Insane, we used to say. Now we're more a little sophisticated. Right? Remember they used to call them insane asylums. 
point. I mean, people were insane. I mean, there was some truth in that. <laughs> I mean, not for the poor people, but I mean, just understanding, you know, that there is a sanity and there is an insanity. And people who are insane, who do not see reality, who think their own projections, their own voices are real and follow them around in every direction, these poor people need to be what? Gathered up, you know, and put into a safe environment where they cannot harm uh, themselves or harm others. But we've escaped. <laughs> Right? And Gary wonders why the world is the way it is. They've escaped, Gary. And they're out there, they don't even see what they're doing. Do they? No, they're, they're, they're crazy. They're insane. Right? They think this will go on forever. Just gobble, gobble, gobble. Eat up all the resources, you know. Really. We'll all be fine. I mean, that's crazy. Again, unfortunately, you see, these teachings, I'm not saying Buddhism is the only place. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> there are many places in this world that have sanity. But this is sanity. Can you see it? This is sanity. This isn't Dharma. This is sanity. And, and, and the difference between, let's say, us and somebody who is insane, now I'm coming back to Sandy, is, is we have. See, when you're insane, in a certain sense, when you're in it, there's no hope because you actually are totally in it. Right? You believe. We're fortunate, those of us in this room. We're crazy, but we kind of know we're crazy. Right? You can see that's, 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 that's good. Right? You know, so we can kind of pull ourselves back. Right? There's enough it's good karma, there's enough sanity in it. And even when we're crazy, even when we're running amok, we're creating suffering for ourselves and others, and, and you know, there's a voice inside us for some reason that goes, This is not working. Right? For some reason. This is crazy. And then we discover Dharma, let's say, again, I'm not excluding uh, every tradition, but this is just the one I know. There's this whole body, incredible body of teaching and philosophy and psychology, and, you know, practice, and, you know, that's all about sanity. Insane. It just describes reality in a very astute, clear, is that, is it clear? That's, that's what this is. Don't make it into something uh, religious, <laughs> okay? Or mystical, or esoteric. This is sanity. This is clear thinking. This is seeing things as they really are. This is health. Is that clear? That's all this is. But you have to be convinced of it over and over and over again. If you're just convinced of it while you're at retreat and you walk out of here and two days from now you're back in it, don't blame me. Don't blame the Buddha. Don't blame uh, Atisha. Right? Is that clear? If you want to be sane, if you want to really lead a good, purposeful life, here's the man. I don't get a cut if you buy it. There's no, no hidden agenda here. You know? Is that clear? But if you walk out this door, you know, and you jump right back into it, And don't blame your karma. Don't blame your heavy duty karma. Because there's an opening now. And you can walk through it. 
Everybody in this room can walk through. The door is open. If you decide, you know, just to kind of keep walking on, but, you know, we turn to the, you know, the door, the door as you know, as you know well, In Buddhism, there is cause and effect. And there's also in Buddhism, there is free will. It's very interesting. Cause and effects are conditioning this moment, but in this moment, if we are conscious and awake and mindful, we can do something different. Everybody in here can do something different. But you have to be awake, be conscious, you have to you know, be clear about you know, the direction you want to go in life. So you know what to say yes to and what to say no to. What to pick up and what to lay down. You don't know it. And then you will just continue on. Everybody in this room has a default you know, that if you're unconscious and unmindful and not clear and you're not practicing, it will it will take you over. There is no doubt that, that will happen. Everybody in this room, it will happen. Because that's that's the pattern you've been working on. That's what you know. And it's easy. You don't have to do anything, do you? It just unfolds. The way it always has. It's so easy. That's why we can't be lazy. The lazy are, are the causes and effects that have driven us in the past will just continue to drive us. Understanding that we understand that we have to do things differently, make choices. Except for what we say yes to, what we say no to, what the priorities are in our life. Where we put our energy. Uh, so again, after uh, after uh, looking at Absolute Bodhicitta uh, yesterday, we uh, looked at the teachings and practices, just really touching the surface of these t teachings about relative uh, Bodhicitta. And we learned yesterday it goes beyond uh, just compassion. Kindness. It is about truly living a altruistic life that is more toward turned outward for benefiting others than always inward simply to benefit myself. It is a fundamental shift. It is not just becoming more compassionate, a little kinder. Many people think that's what it's about. Not about that. That can just be another stance of self. Wasn't it George Bush or somebody something like a kinder nation? A kinder. What? What? Right, becoming but sort of a kinder, a kinder, kinder. Yeah, kind, you can kinder, kinder. Right, right. right there, there you go. I won't say anything. <laughs> it's not about that. Okay. It's about a fundamental radical shift in view and intention. It's becoming aware of motherly sentient beings. All of us. I remember years ago, you know, in the Zen tradition, uh, they make the four vows, right? One of the vows is, uh, I vow to liberate all sentient beings, right? Big, big vow. Or else you can say, uh, you know, when I, when I make my aspiration, uh, doing my compassion, right? We say what? Charlie, Charlie says it. He says what? When you, at the end of the night, you say what? May this practice benefit all beings. What? Of all be shared equally for the benefit of all beings, and we feel good. Wow. 
wonderful altruistic person I am. Right? It will benefit everyone. Right? See, that's abstract. That's easy. That doesn't mean anything. See, right? These are these are sentient beings. Everybody you encounter during the day, that's a sentient being. You see? So if you want to benefit all beings, you want to benefit everybody you encounter during the day. That's what it means. To have some kind of abstract, uh, you know, uh, intention to benefit all beings that doesn't see that we're talking about real people. It's, it's kind of, you know, developing a compassion that's sort of in its own realm. That is why in the Tonglen and the Metta, we actually visualize people, people we know. Oh, oh, that person, the one I really don't like, the one who gives me a hard time, the one who disappointed me, or hurt me, or betrayed me, or did something to my child. Oh, that person. Hmm. That's hard. I don't want to do that. Rather do metta for everyone. Spread the light of loving kindness in every direction. How wonderful life. And how wonderful the world is. It's kind of like a you know, uh, you know, a, a meta practice that they do at Disneyland. <laughs> right? And then everybody goes home, you know, they take off their Mickey costumes. Go home. Everybody was in fantasy land all day, you know. They have to leave and get back in their cars. Kids are screaming, you know. But for a few hours there, it was all kind of wonderful, wasn't it? Everything was just wonderful. I remember the first time I went to Disney with my kid, I thought, oh, maybe we should turn the world over to these people. <laughs> you know, they, they every, everything works, you know, everybody's kind and nice and happy and you know. Maybe we could sell the world to Disney one day. They could run it. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so our our compassion, our loving kindness, our altruism, our generosity. Generosity. Someone's given a Dharma talk. Generosity. If we are honest with ourselves, who are we most generous to in this life? Whose needs are we most focused on you know, being generous to? Who? Me. Oh. You like going out to eat and not cooking tonight? Here, let me take you out. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve it. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, no, you sick of the old car, like a new car. You deserve it. <laughs> Tired of the old dishwasher. You deserve a new one, yeah, right? I mean, let I me mean, think about it. We have no problem practicing generosity to ourselves, right? And maybe you know to you know close family. You know, you mean you know, right? But can you see that's where it stops? After that, we're miserly. You know, and even if we give to causes, you know, it's like it's after it's after all my needs are taken care of, aren't they? If we're honest. So generosity is a bodhisattvic practice. Because a bodhisattva, they look at their body, they look at their intelligence, they look at their time, they look at their energy, they look at their financial resources, they look at everything they have, and their only thought is, how can I use this to benefit others? Oh, that's what it's all about. 
I thought it was all about me. All these things are for me. Can you see the difference? That's what I'm saying. This path, this bodhisattvic path, is radical. It's different. You know, you look at everything you have and you go, you know, how can how can uh, how can I use this to benefit? So please reflect deeply on this path and this practice of, you know, again, like I said, you know, the practice of giving and receiving, <laughs> the exchange of tongue land is not just a little technique as it's been reduced to. It is a willingness to exchange even my own happiness you know, to make myself uncomfortable to bring benefit to another. And you know, people do that all the time, actually. You, know? you look at these people, uh, doctors without, doctors without. You know, I mean, you know what I mean? I mean, they're, you know, you know, they could have a cushy practice back, you know, medical practice wherever they come from. You know, you know. Maybe really nice cushy practice, but they're out there in some hellhole, you know, endangering their own well-being, you know, they're exchanging, can you see, that's what they're doing. They're exchanging their safety, their happiness for benefiting others. So please understand that this is not, you know, unknown to us. You know, people do it. There's people who've never heard a word of Buddha Dharma. But that's what it, this is about. Well, again, not everybody can is ready to run out and join uh, Doctors Without Borders. But you know, so many opportunities just in our ordinary life as we go through our day, to you know, everybody we encounter is our is our mother, is our child. So we care about them. Again, I've used the example before, but again, you know, you could have some complete stranger who you've been walked by every day, and all of a sudden, if some, something turns out, that somebody find, tells you, oh, that's your second cousin, actually, what happens? Next time you see them, you're, you, 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 you relate totally differently. Why is that? Same person. But somebody told you what? You're related. That's just an idea. But right away, you change to them. It's interesting. You know, people think, oh, you have to kind of do all this work. No, no. You know, you know, the example that Shanti Deva goes with the horse, you know, everybody know that one. It's like, you know, again, those were the days uh, with the Shanti Deva Pachurubashi. But anyhow, one of them, you know, it's like, uh, you know, you know, you're at the horse market, right? And uh, this guy over here is a horse. He couldn't care less about it, right? Whether it's healthy, whether it's unhealthy, you know what I'm saying? Right? Just another horse. You go over, you look at it, check it out, do a little horse trading. Now it's yours. One minute after you bought it, all you're caring about is how's my horse? All right, how's it? You know, you know, does it need something to drink? And you know, is it is it is it sick? You know, I mean, right? Why? What's changed? Same horse, but now it's what? Mine. You know, Shanti Davis says. You know, just call everybody me. <laughs> he, he says that. He said, it's just labeling. You know, the only reason we, we see the separation is we go, my body. But what if I called everybody else's body my body? So that's just, a, that's just a, you know, how we label things. It's who labels we enter the world of duality and separation. All motherly sentient beings, there's a reason they use those phrases. Because when you say it, and again, if your mother is somebody you care about, oh, you know, this is a motherly, you know, this person waiting on me is a motherly sentient being, might have been my mother. Right? Or this is like my child. Yeah, that's all you have to do, and, the, and it, it, it changes instantaneously. Right? You, you don't have to do 15 years of Tong Len practice.
So again, um, you know, the practices we did last night, with absolute bodhicitta, nature of mind, resting in awareness, just be good and change in self and other, willingness to bring the sufferings of other beings into ourselves and to give them uh, uh, everything good that we have is transforming. I hope uh, you understand that. Now, uh, uh, the next, obviously, uh, you know, there are two things I want to know now. One is, uh, are there any questions or confusions uh, that anybody has about what has been presented at retreat before we leave? And then we'll just spend a few minutes talking about uh, future practice. Yes. Right, right. These are the preliminaries, and they're not about self. The preliminaries are really just really about this world. You know, what's what's going on in this world? You know, it's like the forest, not the trees. So these are like, you know, it's like all of a sudden, you know, you know, there's Nancy. Like, what's going on in this world? You know, why do I suffer? Why do people? You know, what do I want? Oh, so you get impermanence. Oh, that's so that's. You know, all this disappointment and frustration when things change. And this one, I thought I had it here, and then it changes and comes back. Oh, I thought there was something wrong. Oh, no, that's just the way it is. Inside, outside, atoms, you know, everything is cause and effect. Oh, it's not just, things aren't just happening. Things aren't just happening to me. It's cause and effect. And the other person, and me, and how I, right? So it's, Again, defects of samsara. There's a reason that I've worked so hard to find happiness and meaning by doing this and that. And even when I get it, it still doesn't work. You know what I mean? So it's like big picture. Okay? You know, when you get into things like absolute bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta and absolute, that you really get into self distortions. Any other questions about any of the practice? Yes. Well, that's a way of establishing relationship. It, it's not, please understand, I know you have children, obviously, and we have parents. I mean, there's obviously kind of deeper karmic connections, right? You know, the, in the terms of responsibility, right? Right? So Brandy has a special relationship with her children. She's not going to go home and say, you know, I'm really now going to care weekly for all children. You guys are on your own. Okay? You know, so it's not, right. it's so, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. Mm Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So I, I appreciate, I mean, Maria is saying, I can appreciate everything, but there's also, for at least for you and other people, there's a human element, and, and many things uh, uh, I'm, I'm scared of, and other things I really have a hard time with, certain kind of situations. I don't know if I'm ready to go uh, into Ebola regions, and, you know, right? Yeah, so I think... You know, it's interesting. Uh, things like courage, we're talking really about courage. Courageous, you know, and, and actually, you know, uh, another name for bodhisattvas is often uh, the awakened warrior. Interesting, the awakened warrior. Uh, yeah, so courage is a big part of this. 
opposite of that. What's the opposite of fear? Uh, confidence is another, and I think that's part of it. Uh, so again, I would say the fact that you recognize in certain areas within yourself and in life a lack of courage or more fear, um, less courageousness, more, <laughs> right? Uh, not so confident of yourself uh, is good. I mean, but again, I would say to everybody like that, please understand it's not as if there's a courage switch. There's a confidence switch. Confidence and courage is something you develop. Right? And, and again, how do you develop it? By taking steps. <laughs> By taking steps in that direction. Remember we talked about the miser. You know, again, you know, can he give something from his left hand to his right hand? Right? That's, you know, that's a beginning. At least there's some giving. <laughs> you know, you're loosening that tightness. So again, I would certainly say, if you recognize that, you know, if your goal is, gee, I would like to be that courageous. I would like to be that confident that I could deal it with all kinds of people and situations without fear or, you know, uh, or, or strong sense of self holding back and wanting to protect. You know, again, I would, again, just sort of take that as a practice. Right? Again, and it's a twofold practice. One is to always as we've done here, is to look into that mind for that self that is giving you the message that it's too much for you. Is that really true? If that's what the message you're getting from your historical Maria. It may not be true. You may be more courageous than you think. Remember the cowardly lion, the Wizard of Oz. We didn't read The Wizard of Oz in Austria. Uh, you know, the cowardly lion. And the cowardly lion actually turned out to be pretty courageous. Uh, but he could never be courageous for himself, could he? But for his Dorothy and his friends, he found courage. So, again, uh, you might say, gee, I'm just a, a fraidy cat. But, you know, if somebody, when your children was, were young, were threatening your children, you might be surprised by uh, how brave you were. You see what I'm saying? It's kind of interesting. And and you should kind of notice that. See? Yeah. You know, usually I'm just a wimp, but for some reason, you know, I was, right? And that shows you that it is there in you. Right? But for some reason, uh, you, you tell yourself a story that it's not. But you see in circumstances, uh, you know, you, you, you will be. And it's always amazing to me. I see these little birds going after these big birds that are threatening that are threatening their nests and the big birds take off i mean they're kind of like you know i see them chasing these hawks around i go wow three little birds why it's protecting its young so uh, again i would i would definitely take steps to build courage and confidence right uh, and again, helpful in that is to more and more see that the messages of self may may not be real messages. Okay, uh, but also again to increase your concern and love for others as a motivator. Because again, if I said if your children were threatened, what would you do? And Maria would say what? Protect them. I mean, you, would would you think about it if your children were living on the street and all of a sudden, uh, you know, somebody came up to harm them? Would you just start running? Why not? Automatic. automatic, right. But what is the automatic pilot? Courage within you and, and a willingness at that moment not to think about yourself. Right? If you thought about yourself, you'd be running down the street, wouldn't you? But you're not thinking about yourself. You see, and that's, so that shows you in the world of selflessness, in the world of connection to others, there is courage. It's just there. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> we only have a short amount of time. Yes, and then we'll finish.
Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. So the, you see, that's a very practical question. Tonglin is new to her, uh, you know, before you take it mobile and you start you know, doing it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. So you begin, you know, just by bringing it into your meditation. Right. And again, you notice, you'll see in the instructions, there is like, this is for meditation. This is post meditation. So first you could have, you know, you know, get it perfected in meditation. And again, you begin, you know, like the miser, you begin, you know, can you even just begin to take work with your own self? Just like that. And perhaps can you begin to work with your future self and work with them? And then maybe you uh, work, you know, family, friends. Right? So you start out, you know, do some light lifting first, which could be heavy. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so you start out like that, and sort of like we we're saying with Maria, as your strength develops, you know, you begin to move out. And it's again, it's to me, it's much better uh, to see whether you can do it for yourself before you go. I'm going to do. Oh, I'm going to do it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, just just learning to work in this open, compassionate way with our own self. No longer turn away from it. No longer manipulate it. But be totally open. And, and, and use the, the, this transformative alchemy of Tonglen, you know, to, to heal it every time it arises. Okay? Yes, and then yes. Yes. If that was your brother, if that was your brother, if that was your brother, if all of a sudden you saw this dirty person, right? And all of a sudden, let's say, as you got closer to them and they came up to you, you realize, oh, I, you know, let's not go your brother. Let's say, oh, I used to work with him. He was a colleague. What would, what would happen at that moment in your heart to that aversion? There's no me. Everything's just arising in awareness. Again, we can talk this way. In the, in the deepest sense, everyone is me because every everyone we perceive is arising in the same awareness uh, that even the me arises. So in that sense, uh, there is no separation. But from the practical, the practice point of view, you know, can you see to say it's me may have meaning to you, but to get the heart going, the connection to say, oh, it's my child, it's my brother. Can you see it, 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 it just has a little more juice to it? And it's important that in our compassionate activity that there be juice. That's why, again, motherly sentient beings, my child, all beings are my children. 
I mean, it's it's like in this world, that's probably as close as it gets to non-separation. Okay? Winter. Mm-hmm. Say that? All acts of compassion benefit someone but hurt someone else? Oh, oh, so can you give me an example? So the, I'm just a, so. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. 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 Maybe. I mean, that's a maybe. Right. So, yeah, so again, you know, and we, we, we can't get into it. That's another Dharma talk. But again, in, 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 oh, so the question is about <laughs> that sometimes one can, uh, you know, seemingly act compassionately, uh, such as uh, on the property, there are some, all these baby ducklings. And as we've noticed, over, for those who've noticed over these days, uh, their numbers are diminishing. And if you've been up at night, you've seen little raccoons, big raccoons running around here. You know where they're going. Uh, so and so you're saying, but, you know, by by protecting the ducklings, if I make that choice, uh, might I not be starving a, a raccoon? You know, so. You know, so wisdom and compassion, okay, this is important. Uh, you know, uh, it's been a while. I used to rail about sentimentality at retreats with people, but that's what you're talking about. You know, compassion without wisdom and understanding, intelligence, is sentimentality. It's just all oh, the bleeding heart, but but it has no clarity. It doesn't you know? It doesn't see clearly that you know that in nature there is a kind of balance, right? And that when we act, uh, there are consequences, right? And, and, uh, and, you know, things aren't that simple, are they? And so, and so uh, you know, uh, again, in, uh, in if you see statues of, uh, of Valakiteshvara, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, uh, you will see in his or her hand the eye of wisdom. It's very important. I mean, there's a reason it's there. It's not just sentimental, you know, flowers and, and teddy bears. Oh, poor ducklings. Need to save them all. You know, it's, ducklings live in their own duckling world and duck world right? and natural world. And in that world, there are ducklings and there are predators. And predators, you know, have you ever seen any little baby raccoons? They're quite cute too, right? And when they're babies, you'll go, oh, you find a little baby raccoon, you take it home. And you Feed it, and you want to take care of it. And it grows up. They're big. You release it. It's right for the ducklings. <laughs> I mean, again, this is the world. This is this is the truth of the world, isn't it? And, and uh, you know, either we control it, but as we know, uh, you know, we eliminated predators out west, and all of a sudden we find we have other problems. And so, you know, there is a balance in nature. Intelligence, wisdom will show us it. Now, again, it doesn't mean if you're out there and you see uh, some ducklings and you see raccoons circling, you may. I remember once being somewhere and I, and I saw something just like that. I saw this uh, mother bird and uh, a baby bird. And I saw this cat. I said, creeping up to it. And then I picked up a rock and I threw it at the cat. I made a choice in, in that moment. Well, yeah, but uh, again, let's just stop now just for time. But again, I would say, you know, compassion, you know, the capacity to both perceive and that there is suffering going on, empathy, and the desire and the action of relieving that suffering, there has to be some kind of intelligence operating. 
or we can make it worse. There are many people in here who have thought they were acting compassionately and, and they only made the situation worse or blew up in your face, right? That shows, and often that's because there was no intelligence. We were just being sentimental. Buddhist compassion is not sentimentality. It's just not, the, you know, the, oh, poor, you know, so-and-so, right? And we know the classic one is in, in, in addiction, you know, oh, poor so-and-so, you know? They're going through such a hard time. They haven't had a drink all day. Uh, wouldn't it be nice, you know, I should go out and, you know, get them some, right? Give them some money. It's not very compassionate, is it? Because it's not decreasing their suffering. It's only facilitating. Uh, so we need to uh, take a break first so we have enough time uh, so we can do our closing circle. Again, uh, as I said to you, uh, you're at retreat. You, uh, you can do our closing circle. You'll be saying all kinds of wonderful things. Uh, and uh, you've said them before. For those who've been on retreat, you know, does it mean that your intentions aren't good? But, you know, as Santi Davis said, there is bodhicitta of intention and bodhicitta of action. So we're having good intentions, it's good, but if they are not acted upon and brought into life, into the world of activity, uh, they will just stay good intentions. So it is very important that uh, you understand uh, that uh, what, what is awaiting you at home is a, is a life that has not been on retreat with you. And if you want it to be different, you will have to be different. And you will have to be clear and conscious and diligent and vigilant right, about how you want to proceed in this life. Now again, you know, take refuge in Buddha Dharma Sangha, take refuge in your teacher. I mean, you know, Buddhism just doesn't abandon us, <laughs> right? But historically is known, you know, having, uh, having teachers, having spiritual friends, uh, having teachings, uh, you know, having Sangha, having practice centers, these are all there to what? To support us so we can follow through Right? Because left to our own devices and because most of us live in worlds and with people who aren't necessarily uh, Dharma practitioners and enlightened beings, they may be very good people, right? But they don't get this. And that's just the way it is. So we have to understand that, that if there is something within us in our life that we want to change and transform, we need to make sure that we have the supports and the resources to make that happen. And that's why we have community, and that's why we have teachings and intensives and retreats and days of mindfulness and you know, websites, <laughs> spiritual friends and mentors, you know, just here to, you know, to help us. So please, uh, you know, uh, you know, consider my three-year-old grandson, whose mantra is, I can do it myself. He's only three years old. There's so much he can't do. But he thinks he, you know, he wants to do it all himself. So somebody has to say to him, I can do your little help. Okay? Uh, so there's a three-year-old in each one of us. You cannot do it by yourself. Oh, it's called the Great Path of Awakening. But but again, uh, I mean, this is, I mean, actually, these days there must be a dozen books. I mean, but this this is this is wonderful. But uh, you know, there you know, I, I think Long Gen Lo, Lo is a very popular teaching. So there are many many uh, things. But this is the classic great Dharma teacher commentary. So. Um, Last dismiss.